Welcome back to Haunted and Historic Australia for another episode in our Criminals, Cutthroats and Convicts series. We are finally settled enough in our new places to be able to do a good story. And a good story this is. That girl. A definition of that girl that you may have heard Gen Z or the Alpha Generation throwing around over the last couple of years. Well, that girl, as per social media, is someone who prioritizes wellness, productivity, beauty, and mindfulness. Someone who appears to have their life perfectly together and is often used as a motivational concept for others who want to improve their lives. Well, have I got that girl for you. It is hard to imagine in the early days or years in the European settlement that women would have any of the luxuries that we have today, and most women did not. The convict women certainly didn't, but even some of the soldiers' wives did not have many creature comforts, let alone dresses. But in time, some of the richer women who ended up down under sent for items back home in England. And space willing aboard convict ships had clothing and trinkets, jewellery and homewares to make it feel at least a little comfortable, a little like they were still rich ladies. Well, this is the story of a rich lady. I wouldn't really say she was a criminal, although she was associated apparently with one, being her father. This lady, well, we'd really call her a girl to start. That girl, as she would be called these days. I'm talking about Governor William Bly's daughter, Mary Bly. Now, Mary Bly was very much liked by her peers, adored by her elders, and looked up to by her juniors. She was also quite a good looking girl and had a lot of male attention. But she was the governor's daughter, and they were all very careful not to disrespect her. Mary Bly was not a shrinking violet either. If she had something to say, she wasn't shy. She spoke her mind as she wished. But let's get to Mary's beginnings. A fiery Aries girl. She was born on the 1st of April, but she was no fool. Born in 1783 in Douglas, a town on the Isle of Man. The daughter of then commander, William Bly and Elizabeth Betham. Now Mary's childhood was very privileged, but there was a couple of years where she didn't quite know whether she'd see her daddy again. And we'll get back to that, but it's a big reason as to why she stood by her daddy for all those years. Now Mary was actually married in 1805 to a John Putland who was a lieutenant in the Royal Navy, having served in the Battle of the Nile in 1798 under command of Horatio Nelson. When Governor Bly was offered the position of Governor of New South Wales, his wife Elizabeth did not want to go, scared of the long voyage. But Mary wouldn't stay behind and agreed to go with her father to the land down under and a most primitive from what they had heard, land. Mary was a challenge seeker, and with hubby John coming too, the 23-year-old was ready to go. Mary had grown up with wealth all of her childhood. She was going to a new country now though, across the other end of the world, and somewhere there were convicts, bad people. The colony was only young too, 18 years. There had been some infrastructure, but not to the degree she had experienced in her wealthy world. Still, it was an adventure. Mary and Dad William Bly would travel aboard the convict ship Lady Madeline Sinclair, which was mainly a transport ship with passengers and only a few convicts. Husband John would travel on the escorting vessel HMS Porpoise for the seven-month voyage. You would think 
everything would have been smooth sailing, right? <laughs> of course not. William Bly was technically captain and was to be the governor of New South Wales at this time. Commander Joseph Short of the HMS Porpoise believed he was in charge of the voyage. Short believed that Bly and daughter Mary were to be escorted safely to Sydney. Bly, however, believed he was already governor and that it was his voyage to command. So needless to say, testosterone was running high on the high seas. Well, when Captain Bly decided to change course during the voyage for the Lady Sinclair ship, Commander Short of the HMS Porpoise ordered his first officer, which happened to be John Putland, Mary's hubby, to fire two warning shots over the Lady Sinclair, most likely to say, hey, you're not going that way. John freaked out, but obeyed the order and fired over the bow of Lady Sinclair's ship, the ship carrying not only beloved Mary, wifey, but also captain and future governor, papa-in-law. Yes, he should have been worried. Well, two shots were fired across the bow of the Lady Sinclair, and when it did not correct course immediately, Commander Short almost gave the order to fire directly at, or shoot to hit. You could imagine how mad Bly and bly would have been, and how worried John must have been for the remainder of the trip. But after the seven month long voyage, they must have been so glad to be on land. And although Governor Bly sent Commander Short home to England on the next immediate return ship in disgrace, Bly kept HMS Porpoise as his principal naval unit and had John to command it. When, of course, he wasn't Bly's aide-de-camp or governor's secretary. Bly was welcomed into the colony in Sydney by New South Wales Corps Commander Major George Johnson, also by Richard Atkins on behalf of the civilian officers and John MacArthur on behalf of the free settlers. All should have gone smoothly, shouldn't it? No. <laughs> Otherwise the episode would end here and it'd be too short. We can't have that. Now at Government House, Mary took charge, which had seen some repairs since the first foundation stone was laid only three months after the first fleet landed. Probably designed by either Clerk Henry Brewer or convict builder James Bloodworth. Either way, it had seen better days by now, 18 years. Mary would give it a makeover. She hosted many parties, dinners and balls. Life was quite grand, not scary at all, thus far. She kept her high society status by keeping up to date with the fashion of the UK. Having clothes and material sent from London, mainly from her mum back home, Mary also sent her mother some unique Australian bird feathers and precious stones from New South Wales. Now there's a particularly funny story that goes along with Mary and her starlet status. Well, she was well liked as we've said previously, and she was also quite a Christian girl. They'd go to church very regularly every week. And in true style, she'd always have a new frock or dress to wear, her Sunday best. Well, the story goes that she's had some of the latest dresses sent over. One took her eye particularly. It was so soft and flowing. She put it on to wear to the Sunday Mass. Well, everybody noticed this dress. She didn't really know how to wear it and didn't have a slip underneath, but wore it proudly until somehow during the mass, 
Perhaps it was when they caught up to sing the hymns. There was a lot of sniggering and giggling going on. Mary had put it down to the fact that something funny must have been said. She looked great. And the priest had to get order in his church. What on earth was going on? Well, they were looking at her dress. The sun seemed to have come through one of the church windows, just so that it shone a ray directly on Mary's dress. The dress had been see-through, and they could see the outline of Mary's legs. Well, that wasn't supposed to happen back in those days, let me tell you. Mary was mortified. She ran from the church, crying. Oh, the embarrassment. Now, William Bly was next to her the whole time, and he had no idea what was going on. And he didn't like it at all. Why were they laughing and sniggering at his daughter and made her run out of church in the middle of mass? Gosh, well, I'm sure he later found out. It's just one of those things that that girl doesn't need happening. How embarrassing. But for the most part, Mary had a blast and met a lot of new friends in the colony, as well as having some of her own friends probably coming over from the UK. But what was such a grand time became gloomy. Hubby John began to get sick almost immediately after he arrived. Despite Mary being the belle of each ball and the hostess with the mosters, her private time was spent at Hubby's bedside as he slowly became deathly ill with tuberculosis. Sadly, John died 18 months after they arrived in Sydney and was buried on the grounds of Government House so as he could be visited by Mary at his graveside. It wasn't going to get any easier for Mary when only three weeks after losing her husband, tension were rising in the colony to overthrow Daddy, William Bly, over the trade of rum. This being the Rum Rebellion of 1808, noted in all the books. Go and read them. A coup staged by the New South Wales cause to overthrow Bly because he stood in their way of extortion. Now let's get a little bit into this rum rebellion, because that's the whole thing. After Governor Philip left in 1792, so did many of his rules of fairness and order that was in place. In Governor Philip's place was then Commander Francis Groves, who had very loose rules, especially where his troops and mates were concerned, and he also had control over the convict labour. Where Philip was fair, Gross was greedy. The New South Wales cause soon became known as the Rum Cause, as they extorted the trade, especially where spirits were concerned. They grew very rich and kept their cash, buying up land for themselves and paying convicts for their labour in rum, getting them all drunk and dependent on the stuff lining their pockets and buying more land and extending their reach into Parramatta, especially close friend and ex-core John MacArthur, who scored particularly well under Gross. Things had been going very well for this bunch of rum-running redcoats. After Gross, many other governors took over, but either joined in with the rum cause or couldn't oppose them. In 1795, Governor John Hunter had MacArthur resign as Inspector of Public Works, a position that allowed him to line his pockets and assist the cause extorting land and goods. MacArthur was so mad, he wrote home to the British government and said that Governor Hunter was responsible for the widespread drunkenness due to the excessive rum wages convicts had even though it was widely known that it had been the rum cause. Even the life of a doctor, Chief Surgeon William Balmain, was threatened when he called for an investigation into an assault on a civilian 
who had been beaten up by MacArthur and the rum corps. The good few in the colony were powerless or too scared to stop them. Now, of course, we know MacArthur pioneered the establishment of merino wool for the colony, which was great for Australia, but he did it by squashing the lives of many and the racketeering. Governor Gidley King tried to take MacArthur down also, sending him to face a court martial on various extortion and monopolising charges. He documented it all in a large volume that he sent along on the voyage with MacArthur. Big mistake. The documents never made it to court and the case in 1802 was dropped. Now MacArthur used his free ride back to London to lobby for support on his wool production back home. Support from Lord Camden saw him gain more land despite even Sir Joseph Banks trying to stop him. In 1805, after a few years now, he arrived back in Sydney stronger than ever. Someone needed to stop him. Well, Bly was selected. He had a vicious pet with a lot of teeth named Mary. Oh, I mean, apart from Mary, he had also survived the mutiny on the bounty, which several movies have actually been made about. And we too shall have an episode on this in greater length. But in short, the story was that in 1787, a Royal Navy vessel, HMS Bounty, was on a mission to transport breadfruit plants from Tahiti to the West Indies. However, after a five-month layover in Tahiti, many of the men had formed relations with the Tahitian ladies, and the men did not want to leave. Captain Bly, being a stern man, demanded that they all board and go. Unhappy with the way the crew acted and the effort that they were putting into their work, he became harsh and handed out penalties. He was abusive, as claimed by Lieutenant Christian Fletcher, who rounded up the men to overthrow Bly and his men. Well, they did. Lieutenant Christian Fletcher and some of his mates. They forced Captain Bly and 18 of his most loyal men into a small boat like a life raft. Any of those loyal men that couldn't fit were taken as hostages. And the mutineers took off back to Tahiti and Pitcairn Island. While Captain Bly had to navigate the small boat with the 18 occupants, 6,500 kilometres of water to get to safety. It took almost two years, or around about two years, for them to get back to London. And when they did, they sent the Royal Navy out to recover the mutineers and have them stand trial. But we'll get back to the rest of that story, Mutiny on the Bounty, at a later time. For now, we go back to Governor Bly and the Rum Rebellion. Well, we have so much information on William Bly. Naturally, he was the governor. So we'll have to do a follow-up episode on William Bly. So as that we don't get too off track with Mary's story. Now, to cut a long story short with the Rum Rebellion, John MacArthur, who was being placed on trial for all the wrongdoings he'd been doing in the colony with regard to the rum cause, rallied support behind him through the troops and military through the rum cause. And that reach was very high. During John MacArthur's trial, there were six judges who were military men in John MacArthur's pocket. And there was an appointment of a judge advocate or acting judge advocate at the time, Richard Atkins. Now he was intimidated by John MacArthur as well as the six judges who were all military captains and such. And Richard Atkins fled, fearing his own life. He fled to Governor Bly and told him of what was going on. Governor Bly who wasn't meant to be a part of the trial, 
because the king or crown appointed a judge advocate. Bly sent word to the court that they must have a judge advocate present, otherwise they have no trial. Well, they weren't going to wait around and released John MacArthur at the end of the day against Bly's wishes. Bly notified the captain of the troops at the time, who was George Johnson, and he did not respond. The next morning, Bly notified the Provost Marshal, William Gore, to act and arrest John MacArthur at once as he'd been released overnight. Also, a messenger went to Major George Johnson that if he wasn't going to respond, that he would replace him with Captain Abbott in his absence. Well, Johnson didn't like this very much and assigned himself Lieutenant Governor and released John MacArthur. Well, what a fight. It was backwards and forwards the whole time. The troops and Major Johnson were against Bly. They were in MacArthur's pocket for years. He looked after them. So, of course, they weren't going to let him fall. And this was the beginnings of the mutiny, the overthrow of Governor Bly. Now, at this point, MacArthur joined with military man Major Johnson and they set up a strike against Bly, coming to the house to take him by force. Arrested Bly. There was a witness to this arrest and he seems to believe and he said so 200 years ago now it was only two weeks after mary had lost her husband john putland they were still in mourning and the rum corps marched up to the governor house to the gate they had just been having lunch and there was such a commotion at the front gate Gore had finished his meal and said goodbye, was on his way out when he noticed through the window all the red coat soldiers coming up toward the gates. He quickly went back in and notified Mary and William Bly, to which Bly replied, keep cool and watch. That, because of his experience under a mutiny previously, he knew to keep calm, but did he? This was, of course, from Gore's recollection and the chaos that ensued to take Bly. Well, Mary wasn't going to have any of that. The story goes that Mary, dressed in her finery, walked to the gates and demanded to know what they were up to. They wouldn't talk to her, of course, and demanded for the gates to be opened. Well, they got the gates open and Mary stood in their way cursing at them and saying they were not to arrest the governor. That was treason. Anyways, they pushed her out the way. And she, oh, if you can imagine what her face would have looked like at the time, they marched themselves into the house, arresting anyone that got in their way, including Gore. They searched the house for a good amount of time, soldiers ransacking and going through every single room they couldn't find him. Now, there are two sides to this story. One was the military side, or the rum corps, stated that they found him cowering in a guest bedroom upstairs, which they dragged him out and took him to the coach outside. Now, Gore's story was that Bly had gotten up when he realised that the home was going to be invaded by rum corps, decided he was going to get changed, out of his casual clothes in which he'd been having lunch in. The story goes that Bly got changed and as he'd changed and was heading toward the stairs, he saw the rum cores rushing up the stairs to where he would have been. He quickly hid while they were ransacking the house. Now, if you could imagine these guys were here to arrest him, they would have been ready to beat the crap out of him, no doubt. But he hid, and at first they weren't able to find him. Now, Major Johnson kicked up a stink and was really irate. Where is he? 
I demand to know where in the house he is. Because they knew he was there. His, his daughter was standing in their way not to get him. So they went back in for a more thorough look under instruction of Major Johnson. And this time they found him. Now whether they found him cowering under a bed or even just hiding behind a door, we'll never really know the true story because there's two sides to it, of course, and they're both different. But he was dragged out of the house and into a coach at the front that was going to take him to the jail. Once again, there was a mock trial. Mock being that most of the magistrates and judges were all red coats or or rum cause. It was going to be a unanimous guilty against Bly. And first up, William Gore, the Provost Marshal, he had his turn against the rum cause. Well, he stood by Bly to the very end, even almost being in contempt, I suppose you would say. He yelled at them and said that they had no jurisdiction and stood by that until they dragged him out of there and sent him to the mines. I believe he was transported to Newcastle Mines for two years and in that time his young family had to look for the kindness of their friends for assistance. And it was the same for Bly. He knew he wasn't going to get a fair trial under these red coats and he would be placed under house arrest at Government House until further notice. Now Major Johnson at this point was acting governor but he didn't want the position and they called for a new governor to come and take over and that was Governor Favreau. When he arrived in 1808 he didn't want anything to really do about it either. It was funny because most of them stood on MacArthur's side. But then as their consciences got the better of them under treason, they decided to go a little bit more lenient. Well, some of them tried to dig themselves out of a hole where government back home was concerned. But for the most part, Governor Bly was still stuck at home. Now, Major Johnson begged Bly to go home and face the courts back home, but he wouldn't. He knew what he was doing. Even Governor Favreau, when he arrived, asked Bly to travel back to England right away. Well, he wasn't going to do that until he was damn well ready. Well, they weren't going to wait for him. Once again, they sent out a carriage to the governor house to drag him back out again. Well, when they got there, Mary, once again, very upset. Wasn't going to let it happen. Well, not without a fight. She watched Daddy once again dragged into a coach. Well, Mary was livid. She ran behind that cart all the way to the Justice Precinct, which was a fair way. Bly even states in one of his letters later on that he looked to his side on the journey and noticed that poor Mary was running alongside, cursing and asking them to let her father go. He was amazed at how she kept up with the coach and it was such a hot day. Well, she arrived at the same time as the coach and would not let go of her father's arm. So they took them both inside into a cell and luckily enough there was a bed there because it wasn't long after Mary made it through the doors of the cell that she passed out onto the bed. What on earth was going to happen to them? This would be no picnic with the king. Things get a little tricky here. Colonel Patterson takes over as acting governor. It is believed that England government decide they no longer want naval governors and decide to go with Lachlan Macquarie, who'd been in the army in command. But he would not arrive until December 1809. 
So there's a whole year here. Patterson makes an agreement with Bly to leave the colony for England before Macquarie gets there. Well, Bly had other ideas. He agrees to take Mary on board the porpoise and instead of heading for England, head for Port Dalrymple in Tasmania. From here, he sends letters to London explaining what's gone down. And by the time that Governor Lachlan Macquarie is sworn in, he comes back to explain the situation. Well, Governor Macquarie is actually joined by Lieutenant Colonel Maurice O'Connell and his 73rd Regiment. Bly takes comfort in the fact that Governor Lachlan Macquarie was not under any kind of spell by John MacArthur. In fact, he went to work quickly in stomping out this rum rebellion and setting things straight, which was good for Bly because now he could go back to England, although there would be a big court case in England to explain what had happened and the treason involved in overthrowing Bly. Things had settled down in the colony now under Governor Lachlan Macquarie. Well, it was some time in organising Bly to get on another ship and sail for England. And in this time, Mary had grown quite fond of Elizabeth Macquarie, Lachlan's wife. They'd spent much time together and it didn't appear that she had really anyone in the colony that she could turn to. Perhaps Elizabeth Macquarie was now that person. She took her under her wing and even introduced her to Colonel Maurice O'Connell, who took a fancy to Mary, who was a widow, if we remember not too long ago, only a couple of years since John Putland died. Colonel Maurice O'Connell decided he would marry Mary. They got close, and after a little bit of fighting for her affections, Mary wasn't the kind of girl who was going to give in easy. Especially after what had happened. She wasn't very fond of the military at all, be it Navy or Army. But Maurice won her over. And it was just before she was meant to go aboard a ship to sail to England, back home to her mother as well, that she was married to Colonel Maurice O'Connell and she decided to stay with him in the colony. Well, Bly wasn't happy. He didn't want his daughter staying behind in this nut house of a place, and he wasn't gonna stay either. He had Betsy to get home to, who he absolutely missed like crazy. As there was a letter he wrote home to Betsy. This he wrote on his voyage back to her. My dearest love, happily I am this far advanced to meet you and my dear children. I am now well, as is our dear Mary, although I have suffered beyond what I can at present describe to you. Providence has ordained certain things which we cannot account for, so it has happened with us. My perfect reliance that everything which occurs is for the best in my great consolation. In the highest feeling of comfort and pride of bringing her to England, although I thought she could be under no guidance but my own, my heart devoted to her. In the midst of most parental affections and conflicting passions of adoration for so good and admired child, I at last found what I the least expected. Lieutenant Colonel O'Connell, commanding the 73rd Regiment, had unknown to me won her affections. He goes on to explain to his wife that she will not be coming home. Sadly as it turns out, she wouldn't see her mother again, as Betsy dies before she returns to London. And it seems he is a little worried about what Betsy's going to say about this. He ends by advising Betsy that Mary would not have left her new husband. Thus, my dear love, when I thought nothing could have induced our dear child to have quitted me, have I left her behind in the finest climate in the world? 
which to have taken her from into the temptuous voyage I have performed, I now believe would have caused her death. So basically stating that uh, Mary would have probably died on the voyage home if she was to leave her newfound husband after having her previous husband die on her. So it was set. Bly went home to his wonderful wife and kids and enjoyed the creature comforts that being a retired governor granted him after of course he had to go in and out of court cases about the treason and the overthrow. But for Mary it seems she remained in the colony but all too often did she stick her beak into affairs where the navy was concerned. So much so was her contempt for the naval officers and John MacArthur who caused all the grief she'd had to endure over the last couple of years. She even turned her husband against the Navy. Governor Macquarie and his wife Elizabeth were very close to Maurice and Mary and Lockie wrote to England to have Colonel Maurice O'Connell transferred along with his regiment to give Mary a bit of a break I'd say and finally <laughs> the colony could be at peace <laughs> but Mary was such a character and really made her mark here and it's probably why Elizabeth Macquarie liked her so much Elizabeth Macquarie was also another woman who spoke her mind and got things done but it wasn't the last time that she'd seen New South Wales. They returned in the late 1830s and Maurice became Major General of the troops in New South Wales. He also served as acting governor between 1845 and 46. And once again, Mary was Lady of Governor House. It would have been an interesting time for her and she was much older now so she probably wasn't having as many balls and things like that not as the energetic excitable girl who once graced government house to lead a more matronly life as lady o'connell now she bore seven children to maurice so she had had her arms full of babies but they'd all grown up now and were sent away to military school or boarding schools they were set to leave in 1847 to sail back to england but before they left maurice died in 1848 it was the day that they were due to depart well, at this point in time, 1848, there's not much left in London for her. Her mother Betsy and Daddy Bly had both passed away. So she decided to spend the rest of her days in Paris. And why not? She'd earned it. Occasionally catching up with her children, one of which became an Australian politician. Well, we hope you enjoyed this episode on Mary Bly. I was fascinated by her and her strong will to defend her father. She knew what was right from wrong and she was going to stand by him, even if it caused her own death or exhaustion, as it were. But afterwards, she had a great life. And there's little things that I picked up along the way with her sending letters back to her mother and little bits of pieces. Her mother collected a lot of shells and you could see the devotion in the way that William Bly spoke with her. I find it very interesting how they painted William Bly out to be some kind of monster or tyrant. And yet John MacArthur, who was actually the monster and tyrant, got off scot-free and was looked at decades and a hundred years later as being someone who brought so much to Australia. Not so much the person who lined his pockets. But enough about those two. Mary really was the star. Mary was certainly that girl. She 
was someone that everyone looked up to. She stood out in her younger years and then stood out a little older for sometimes the wrong reason in other people's opinion. But whatever was happening, Mary was always front and centre, as she liked to be, making sure everybody heard what she had to say. Well, she was definitely that girl in my opinion. And if you enjoyed the episode, definitely give it a like, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit that notification bell so you're aware when we're posting up Daddy Bly episode very soon.